Muy buenos días a todo el estudiantado, docentes e investigadores del Tecnológico de Monterrey. Esta mañana nos complace tener entre nosotros a uno de nuestros profesores de excelencia internacional, por lo que me voy a permitir cambiar al idioma inglés para introducir la sesión y dar la bienvenida. Good morning, everyone. We are pleased to have this meet and great session with members of our Faculty of Excellence. Let me mention that the Faculty of Excellence initiative is a key foundation pillar for Technological for Monterrey strategic plan. The goal is to bring 100 academic leaders by 2029 to have an impact on the development of our faculty and our students' experience, to promote interdisciplinary synergies and collaborations, and to foster relations with major international academic and research organizations. Now, on behalf of Tecnológico of Monterrey, a School of Medicine and Health Sciences, Tech Salud, we give you the warmest welcome to this meet and greet session, a sharing a space dedicated to our faculty and researchers with our Faculty of Excellence. Without further delay, I give the word to the moderator of the session, Dr. Hugo Alves, who will introduce our inviting guest and will moderate the conversation. Welcome, Dr. Alves. Thank you, Angeles, and thank you, Pio, for being here. Uh, so, just for you to, I will briefly uh, tell you uh, a little bit about this amazing CV that uh, Perolov has. Perolov has currently uh, 532 publications and an amazing record of citations, more than 21,000 citations. Uh, regarding to that, he has a, an H index of 78, and he has contributed to the field of diabetes and metabolic diseases with more than 60 patents. So Perlof Bergren is, comes from and is the head of cell biology and experimental endocrinology uh, head uh, in Karolinska Institute in, in Stockholm, Sweden. And is our distinguished Faculty of Excellency invited professor. Uh, among uh, his participation around the world, Perlof is member uh, of the academic, American Academic of Arts and Science, the National Academic of Medicine in USA, uh, and is a part of the Nobel Assembly at Karoliska Institute. Perolov not only works together in between um, uh, Sweden and the, the Karolinska Institute and the Technologie de Monterrey, he also has participation in several other countries like in the USA, in China, and in Singapore. Um, as uh, Perlof has more than 20 scientific, uh, among scientific grants and scientific awards, uh, we can uh, say to you that he has at least two European Research Council grants, which are the major grants that can be attributed by the European uh, Union. He has a, a very big uh, Novo Nordisk Advance grant. He was two times awarded by the GR, GR, uh, JDRF, which is the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation in the US, and he is a distinguished professor at Karoliska Institute. So the main uh, research areas of, of Perlov are incident in cell physiology and signal transduction in diabetes, pancreatic uh, islets, and of course in the pancreatic uh, beta cell. He is focused also in tissue engineering and human tr uh, islet transplantation. He is the world pioneer in a unique uh, transplantation technique of, uh, of um, uh, pancreatic islets, uh, which is in, in the anterior chamber of the eye, uh, in, in diabetic and in diabetic models, and now we are looking forward to apply to this uh, in the near future to um, patients with type 2 diabetes and also with uh, type 1 uh, diabe di diabetes. Professor, it's such a great pleasure to, to have this conversation with you. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for this opportunity to uh, our students and collaborators know you a little bit, a little bit uh, better. Uh, so the dynamics of this uh, meet and greet is based on a Q&A. So we are going to start with some questions, and then finally, we are going to open up uh, to the audience, for the audience to ask us, uh, the questions that they felt more relevant uh, to, to these to this discussions. And to start with no uh, further ado, uh, let me ask you, so uh, it is fairly easy when for a, for a student from 
biology or biochemistry or engineer to engage uh, with science, but for medical students, this, this relationship is not so observed. Uh, so you were a medical student, you went to the medical school. Uh, can you tell us uh, how was your first contact during research and what was that defining mo moment that tilts the balance for you to pursue the career in, in, in research? So Uru, I think that this is a very relevant and, and important question. And I think uh, I will answer it in, in, in short, but I think this is what we are witnessing now around the world, that a lot of medically educated students are not choosing the research track. And of course, that is a disbalance because in simultaneously what we want to see is a translational approach where basic science goes into the, to the back and into the patients and questions are taken from the patients and going back to, to, the, to the basic science. So yes, I, I recognize it's a problem. And I think that it's not, it must have to do with how they change the educational system. And the medical education in Sweden, for instance, that I know very much about, is changed completely as when I was a student. And a lot of the medical students, when I was a medical student, they, and if they had some interest in, in um, research questions, they choose to go, to go to an institution and try to find a mentor that could help them. And then they were doing some teaching for that institution, for the medical students. And they also then were able to do small research projects. And I was, for instance, choosing medical cell biology as a extra work when I was studying. And that, that was very exciting. And I think that the first encounter with the scientific questions was not so much the scientific questions, but more the environment that you met there. And the mentor that was later on my PhD mentor, that was a very enthusiastic guy. And that worked around the clock. And the fact that around the clock is no longer existing to the same extent at least not in, in Scandinavia, where people are very, very aware of that the working day is stopping at five and you should have your free weekends. I'm not against that, but I think that there was a little bit a different attitude towards work. And what is exciting for me here is to find that the same type of enthusiasm is actually existing among the students at, at Tech de Monterey. And this is interesting. Yeah, 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 and, and definitely, uh, uh, and, and citing our, our dear uh, Vice President of Research on, 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 on Wednesday when he said, uh, Dr. Memo Torre, when he said, science is hard work, so and science uh, never sleep, you know, and of course, choosing your path in, into a career in research, as you said, is being very well influenced by the research milieu where yeah. you uh, introduce introduce to, uh, um, uh, yourself as a young 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 student. Uh, so, uh, for many young people, uh, there is a, a conception that science it's it's easy at at, at the beginning, uh, and uh, that uh, everywhere you look, you you find and and, and discover something. But uh, actually, it's it's not like that way. It takes time. You no. Know? Uh, so, do you think that science is becoming harder or more challenging by, uh, since the beginning where they start discovering and, and, and for example, talking about <coughs> diabetes, uh, discovering pancreatic islets and insulin producing cells? And do you think that nowadays uh, doing science and do research is getting more challenging? And how the development of technology has helped you along the years to to, to perform uh, your research? I mean, it's, it's a good question again, Hugo. I think that, that science is not getting maybe more difficult from the scientific point of view. On the other hand, it's getting more exciting because now you can tackle questions that are much more complex, much more complicated than the ones we could tackle in the beginning when I started. However, there is a serious problem to promote science and get people interested in science because 
the availability of grants for young investigators to establish themselves and actually go for a project that is exciting is getting more and more difficult. And I don't know so much about the granting system in, in Mexico, but you can also, for instance, see in the US where NIH, to get an NIH grant for a young investigator, it's pretty, pretty tough. And I mean, science is, is hard. If you, if you think upon it, because no one tells you what to do. So in the morning, you, know, you need to go up, you need to go to the lab, you need to identify a project, you need to push that project, you need to deal with the agencies that are going to give you money, you need to deal with the editorial offices for publication, and so on and so forth. And if you think upon all of these things, then it's, it's pretty boring. However, if you see that, one percent or a fraction of a percent that give you, give you the reward by exciting, invest, in exciting findings, then it's worth it. But I, don't, I think that science has become more exciting. You can do much more. But yes, it has getting tougher to get the funding to promote your science. Yeah, yeah and getting back on your initial comment that uh, uh, nowadays it's even it's, it's becoming even more harder for uh, researchers to get finance to pursue uh, their, their research. Do you think that we still maintain this romantic view that science is still uh, driven by passion? I think it needs to be driven by passion because otherwise you will never do it. Since the, as I said, all of the, the things that needs to be there in place for you to be able to conduct science uh, if you have no passion, you will not do that yeah. work. And that will build up your resilience to yeah. push forward and continue, even if you have a negative result, which is also a positive because you learn from your mistakes. And, and that may, in fact, also to a certain extent influence. I mean, if you are a medical doctor, you go to your patient, you do the work, and then you go home and you have accomplished something. If you then have to choose among all of these uncertainties, yeah and securities I told to become a researcher. That's maybe why a lot of people are not choosing that path. It's getting too complicated. Yeah, 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 for sure. Just to remind the audience that uh, we are going to open up the discussion for you from uh, Menti. So uh, I think that they will share with you the code in the, the chat of, the, of Zoom for you to be able to access uh, Menti platform and to, in order to put uh, your questions in order for, and for us to ask those questions to Pedal of Bergen by the end of our, our conversation. Uh, so, uh, Pio, when did diabetes research appear in your life? I think that that is, that is also an important question. And obviously, when you start the research, you're not selecting a project. You have no clue what is an interesting project. You, you, are, se flow. you are selecting a mentor that can transmit enthusiasm to you. And it so happened that the guy that became my mentor, he was interested in pancreatic islets. He was interested in diabetes. I had not the least interest in diabetes per se <laughs> at that point in time. But he was so enthusiastic and he even convinced me to move with him to another university in Sweden where he, when he became, he got another professorship there. So from there on, we built this relation that promoted my interest in diabetes. Yeah, and, and looking a little bit on, on the path of your career, it's, it's very clear that your research have, has no borders. And uh, that is uh, one of the most important factors that is driven you to continue in pursuit answers out there. So how does do research outside of Karolinska has helped you to answer the most fundamental questions that you, you want to answer? So you need to find the right environment to do certain type of experimental work. And it could be animal models, it could be equipment, it could be a certain skills among collaborators that you are looking for. And in that case, you need to go where these skills and techniques and animal models are. And that has certainly helped us a lot. So we have been driven by practicalities. So for instance, getting human material we had very little possibilities in Sweden, so that's why we went to Miami. To get the ability to work with non-human primates, it's, 
it's easy. You can do it in Sweden. It's it's possible, and it's you get the permits to do it. However, it costs enormous amount of money, so it's not practical. So that's why we went to Korea, Singapore, and now now China. So I think these type of things should not limit you. You need to go where where you can continue and you can push your projects. Yeah. And, and as you said, you, you are interacting and you are being part of the inf infrastructure of all sorts of universities in trying to look for the answer. Uh, for example, as you said, Korea and Singapore, China now, Technologic de Monterrey. And how do you foresee that tech research ecosystem is uh, prepared to providing the answers that can eventually transform lives? Because the one of the main purposes that we will talk a little bit uh, later is to trying to transform uh, lives of people who have type one and type, and type two diabetes. So how do you foresee that tech research ecosystem can help you achieve this? I think that, that tech has a platform that is extremely exciting. And if you look at what tech can provide to you as a researcher, as a student, it's, it's fantastic. And it's very few places that I have visited around the world where I see the same type of possibilities. So I'm very excited about these opportunities. And as you said, our aim is to establish a technology to treat people with type 2 diabetes. And obviously, in Mexico, type 2 diabetes is a huge problem. And we are seeing that become uh, continuing to be a huge problem. And we see more and more diabetic patients. And this we need from the patient point of view, from the suffering, from these individuals, do something. And we also need to do something from the cost, the health costs that are associated with treating di di diabetic patients. So I see that all of this possibility can actually be met here and, and uh, be developed here at Tech. So, so that is an one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is, of course, that future science in medicine is very much dependent on technologies. It's dependent on optics. It's dependent on electronics and so on and so forth. So what is really exciting is the interface between regenerative medicine and technology. And basically, you have everything here under the same roof at Tech, the Monterey, and the Tech family around in Mexico. So I think this is what make it possible to actually realize your dream in this context. Very well. And just for those that still haven't heard uh, about your project and what you are trying to bring up to tech and trying to develop here, can you brief uh, the audience a little bit what are the main objectives and the basis of this project and a very big and enthusiastic endeavor that you are doing here in, in Tech de Monterrey? So we have been studied the insulin secreting cell as we, we have as Hugo has alluded to. And what we have been interested in is trying to understand why the insulin secreting cells, the pancreatic beta cell, is actually not releasing insulin, why you get diabetes. So that means that we have been very much focused on signal transduction in these cells, trying to understand how the glucose molecule is sh changing into a signaling system within the cell that eventually releases insulin, and why isn't, as I said, that working in, in diabetes. However, back in 2006, we understood that the way we were tackling this problem is, is very naive. And it's not much smarter than taking out a part of your car engine and then try to learn how the whole car is operating. So then we decided, and we were really focusing on finding a way how we could study the insulin secreting cell non-invasively, longitudinally, at single cell resolution within the living organism. And what we then found was that we could use the anterior chamber of the eye as a transplantation site for these small entities. And we could use the cornea as a natural body window to follow signal transduction in our individual cells. And that met with a lot of new and um, very interesting data and a lot of enthusiasm among the science community. And people have now 
use this model not only for pancreatic beta cell research, but also for stem cell research, for cancer research, et cetera, et cetera. And while we were doing this, we, were also, we also got questions whether this could ever be uh, something that could be used for, for treating diabetes in patients. And in the beginning, I said, of course not. You cannot transplant islets into patients. But the results from our animal work were so positive. And I then discussed this with people, one of the leading experts in ophthalmology at the Bascom Palmer Eye Institute in, in uh, Miami. And he looked at me like I was stupid. He said, of course you can. You can do much more <laughs> complicated things than transplanting some insulin secreting cell into the eye. So then we continued to do this. And we did it in monkeys and continued in rodents. And we got FDA appro approval for a clinical trial. And we got also the legal authorities in, in uh, Europe to approve this. So these were then transplantation to patients that had type 1 diabetes. Here in Mexico, as I said, there is type 2 diabetes is the biggest problem. So what we want to do here is, in addition to preclinical basic science work regarding the pancreatic beta cells, we want to, to establish the transplantation technique to patients that are suffering from type 2 diabetes, using the anterior chamber of the eye as a transplantation site, and then using the cornea as a window to what is going on with this graft that we have transplanted. And, and, and it's fantastic. It's the, uh, literally the transduction from the bench to the bedside. You know, this, this is the basis of translational and clinical uh, research, per se. You know? But it, it, it takes time you know, to develop uh, all sorts of these potential ideas to transform eventually the life of, of people. So, and, and because, as, as we talked uh, man, many, many times, that the source of human islets is a very limited source. And eventually, we will not be able to cope with the demand of patients and uh, retrieving these, these uh, the, 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 the pancreatic islets, no? So how, how do you foresee uh, the following years regarding the develop of uh, newer uh, treatments to cure diabetes? So I think that, that to transplant pancreatic islets into the anterior chamber of the eye will be really important. However, the source of material will not be cadavers in the future. It will be stem cell derived islets. And of course, these stem cell derived islets we can genetically manipulate prior to transplantation. So that means that we, have, we will have an unlimited source of pancreatic islets. We will ta we we'll be able to tailor make these islets for certain individuals, which means that we can get a much more precise treatment of the diabetic patients. And that is what I think will be future and will be very exciting. And if you can combine that with technological achievements, such as being able to report and record long-term functionality of the pancreatic islets while it is transplanted to the anterior chamber of the eye, then you are also developing an approach for the patient to be his or her own doctor to follow the faith of this transplant long term. And this is exciting. And this is actually not science fiction. This will be doable. Yeah, of course, but, but, but still, we have a, a lot of ground to explore in order to set up uh, all of these new ways of producing uh, cells in order to, to, to transplant. And, and, because, and, and regarding type 1 or type 2 diabetes and all the, the treatments, where did you find there are the most obstacles and hurdles in, in this type of research? I mean, you always have obstacles and hurdles when you try to introduce something new. That's one aspect of it. The other aspect is that to, met, to meet with enthusiasts, some of these people that you would think should be enthusiastic, they have a, a completely different agenda. Not invented by me cannot be in exciting. So there you have the ego problem, the jealousy problem. <laughs> but what is Im extremely important is to be able to convince funding agencies that this is something they should put money into. Yeah. Because as you say, this is, this is not trivial. It costs money. 
And that's also why I'm very excited being now at Tech de Monterey, being able to engage with the leadership of the, this institution, this university, to be very, very enthusiastic and actually also being, being interested, in being visionary and interested in facilitating this type of approach. So this is where I am very excited. And I think that, that this is a private university, private institution. And that is probably what, and, and the aim of this institution is to be a world leader. And if you have these visions, these aims, then of course, it's also much more easy to, to promote this type of projects. Yes, yes, and of course, and, and uh, ba basically, uh, you're creating here a new research line because it's fairly new to Technology de Monterey, dealing with pancreatic islets, not dealing with di type one diabetes, type two diabetes, and obesity, which is the biggest scope of the most recent uh, Institute for Obesity Research that was created by Tech, and uh, you collaborated so so well, uh, are, are being collaborated so well with, uh, with those. So, but despite the, the research field, what could be the best advice that you could give to a young researcher or a student that want to engage into, into, into research, or is feeling this difficulties and continuing its, its, its career on, on research? I think what, what is important that every young individual is doing is try to identify the most exciting thing that they can do. And it shouldn't necessarily be an easy project. It should be something that is exciting. Whether it's doable or not is not the primary point at, at, at this point in time. It's more important to have a dream and then see with whether that can be realized or not. And in order to do that, of course, you need to find an inspiring milieu, an inspiring mentor that can help you to promote your wishes to do that. And I think that despite what we have talked about now, that there are difficulties in science and it takes a long time, there are obstacles, it's the most fascinating thing that you can do. You go to the lab, you have your hobby, and you are paid for it. It couldn't be better. <laughs> the best job in the world. Absolutely. <laughs> no, no that, that, and, and that's great. And uh, again, uh, I, so because as a, as a student, and many times students doing res research feel very much insecure about the results that they are obtaining. And there is something that is a, a fundamental truth, but it is hard for them to understand. So can you comment on, on the following? There is no negative results in the lab research, in the research. No, and I think it's, it's important that people realize is that you need to think out of the box. And what we see a lot of times today is that you do me too research which basically means that you are do something that you are absolutely sure of that it will be successful because someone else has done similar type of work before. However, you will never be an Elon Musk, you will never be a Bill Gates, or you will never be, be anyone that realizes these big dreams if you are not thinking out of the box. And of yeah. course, thinking out of the box is making you unsecure, but the rewards if you are successful are enormous. However, having said that, it also means that the funding agency, the granting systems need to understand that we need to have a little bit different way of judging science on deciding on what type of projects that should be funded or not. Because you need to take risk in order also to move forward. Otherwise, we are not doing the big leaps that, that are needed. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and of course, and you would uh, you, you have uh, a, a huge record and a, an incredible record in publications and, and citations, and that represents a very successful way to reach and to contribute to understand not also only uh, physiopathology of, of science or physiology of, of pancreatic beta cell, but also the treatment, but that also in the backstage on that, it represents many, many hours, many, many collaborations, and many results that initially were not as you expected. Of but course. 
it, it, it represents perhaps the majority mm -hmm. of the results mm -hmm. within, and we have to learn upon every single result that, that, that we uh, are obtaining in, 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 in the lab. Um, so I think that we can uh, grab a couple of questions in, in, in Menti, just for to have uh, the audience engage with, with Perolov. Uh, so uh, the first question is, uh, Pio, how do you envision your short and middle and long-term objectives regarding this project at Tech? So I think that we are on a good way now to establish the basics for how to move forward. And within tech, that will be the two approaches. We will drive the basic science related to pancreatic islet cell signal transduction, and we will focus on human material transplanted into immunocompromised mice. And that is something that is already on its way, and there are a few details, technological details, that need to be fixed, but that is on its way. We are also simultaneously now promoting the, the protocols needed to get the permission to do transplantation of cadaver islets into human patients. And of course, here we will have an enormous, uh, it will be enormously important to have the right collaborators within the areas of, of um, surgery, ophthalmology, and, and um, to support this. But all of this, is now lined up, and this is where we are moving now with, with full speed. Of course, and, and we need and people, and we need uh, students that are also excited to engage this, uh, th this project uh, with you. And, and actually, in, in that sense, it comes the next question. So how can we involve students in the faculty that are interested in cadetic interdisciplinary um, research? Because we can reach, we have reached medical school, we have reached also an engineering school, and we are all placed together, and we will put, uh, of course, the effort in the near future to reach even more people, because we have, you have been talking with a lot of uh, uh, professors, uh, researchers, in order to reach out, because you want to do interdisciplinary uh, research to find answers. Yeah, no, I mean, as I said, the future in terms of medicine or life sciences is the, the um, multifaceted aspects of, of research where technology meets medicine and the interface in between these two is extremely exciting. And I'm, I'm very impressed with, with people, of course, dealing with microelectronics, optics. That is extremely important. We are very much excited about chemists that are developing compounds that we can use for labeling cells and measuring things within the cells. And then, of course, we want to have biology students that have an interest in, in biology, medical cell biology or cell biology, genetics. So in all of these areas, we are welcoming people. And, and then I think what is important that people have a certain, as I said, identified a certain wish, have a certain project, and then we would be very happy to sit down and discuss how we can, we can promote these interests, these interests into viable and exciting research projects. Yeah, yeah, and a very good attractive is that the possibility of doing networking also. Yeah. So it's not only enclosed to Technology de Monterrey because you are so open to all of these schools and, and, and fields. So the, the possibility of networking, it's, 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 quite, it's quite important. So I have another question. Uh, Dr. Bergen, I want to ask you if you can tell us about why diabetes is, is interesting in Sweden. Uh, is there any, any nutrition factor? Uh, the Sweden does not seem to be fit into the obese phenotype country. This is a very typical question uh -huh. coming from uh, Mexico because Mexico have a, a, very, a huge problem with obesity and, and type 2 diabetes in incidence. Now this is, this is again an, an, an important and interesting question. And it's not so that automatically that all obese people get diabetes. So that is one aspect of it. So you can get type two diabetes being lean. And these are the type of guys we often see in Sweden. But I appreciate your view on Sweden saying <laughs> that the obesity is not a problem. It starts to get the problem as in any other country. And we see 
And this is very sad. We actually see younger and younger individuals getting type 2 diabetes. And you may not know, but you may have heard that previously type 2 diabetes was called the diabetes of the elderly, which means that you got type 2 diabetes when you were over, let's say, around 70 old, years old or older. And that has changed completely. And you will now see kids <coughs> being three, four eight, uh, years of age getting type 2 diabetes. And that is, of course, not at all very good, since then you will, you will not live until you're 100 years, but you will live long enough to encounter all of the diabetic complications, kidneys, eyes, etc. When you got diabetes in the, f in the old times, and you were, let's say, 70 years, and you may live to you are 75 or something like that, you didn't really have the time to develop diabetes. So we have a problem in Sweden with obesity, diabetes, and it still consumes a lot of the healthcare budget. Then regarding type 1 diabetes, and this is something that we don't really understand. It seems that the Scandinavian countries, and then primarily Finland, have a very high incidence of type 1 diabetes. And we don't really understand how come. And this is something that a lot of people from the genetic side are, are investigating and are interested in. But it is, it is a good question. And obviously, if you are in a country where obesity is a huge problem, then you encounter more diabetic patients. That is important. But you can be obese and still not get diabetes. That is also something I want to underline. Yeah, of course. And, and again, uh, providing treatment for diabetes is perhaps even more complex than just applied cell therapy. It must involve some sort of yeah, I didn't, uh, intervention. I, I didn't uh, answer maybe the question completely. Uh, it's, it's nutritional factors are, and lifestyle is, of course, very important. Yeah. And it also tends to be a sort of a socioeconomic problem in a way because the, the food that is not very healthy for you always tend to be the cheaper foods. So that means that if people do not have an economic stable stability, then they go for this type of food. That's one aspect of it. The other aspect is that you see people getting more and more lazy and they are not exercising. It's not that you need to, to, to run marathons. This is not the, the, the thing. But what you need is to move. And now with the computers, with the electrical bike, I hate electrical bike. This is not a bike. This is a <laughs> moped. You should bike. You should move around, and you should walk in stairs. You should not take the elevator one store up. Walk in the stairs. So this is a very important aspect of it. And that means that a lot of the type, the not so severely ill type 2 diabetic patients can actually promote their health dramatically and prolong their lifespan if they do these this, uh, own interventions by eating better, by exercising or moving around. So this is an aspe important aspect. Yeah, and, and, and you're right. In, in, in we all try in a daily basis to, to, comply, uh, to comply with it. Uh, Pio, I have another question, uh, more related uh, on the resilience of researchers. So how do you keep motivation and discipline if you are, getting, uh, if you are not getting the, the funding you need how can you drive attention to the cause and get the money to get this thing done? Maybe I'm, I'm stupid in, and I just, <laughs> I'm like a rubber duck. You knock me down, and I come back with more speed. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's tough. And, and I mean, maybe now I'm getting, getting the experience over so many years in science. I know that life if if you get something very exciting big grant good publication you know that soon you will get no grant and you will get not a good publication and it oscillates back and forth and i think that is extremely important to to understand and again it can be tough and i can understand also the young guys who have been working very hard on a publication and then you get all of these stupid reviews back and the paper is not published, or you fail getting your grant. And this is something that 
is, is part of science education to take this into account, that life is not just fun. It can be, be also very complicated. But this is the life, and it's more difficult in the beginning, of course. But if, I think that if you have enough interest, then, then you will overcome these hurdles. Yeah, and you are totally right on that. And we could, spay, we could spend many, many hours on talking about our, how our research and our papers and grants uh, are being um, evaluated. But this is a talk for another audience and, and another, another time. Uh, Pio, uh, I do not have any more questions for you. I think that we cover up uh, fairly, fairly easy uh, and, and quite nice, and I thank you very much for your uh, availability. It was a pleasure for having you here with us to talk a, li a little bit and to receive some feedback from our, uh, from our community. And I hope that people who are interested that can reach me and, and reach you, and uh, we are going to share our, uh, my, my contact pr primarily, and people who are interested, we can promote discussions because we are here to discuss science and to move forward on, on, on research. So, uh, Pio, uh, thank you very much once again, and it was a pleasure to having you here. Thank you. Well, this definitely when we have a, a nice conversation, time flies so fast. This is how we conclude the meet and greet session with our Faculty of Excellence. On behalf of Tecnológico of Monterrey, School of Medicine and Health Sciences, we thank the audience for their participation and interest in the topic. We share our appreciation to our speaker, uh, Professor Pearl of Bergen, for the inspiring and outstanding talk and particularly also to Dr. Hugo for the conversation and moderation of the session. And last but not least, all the crew that has been helping us to have this session in this mo modality. Well, thank you and good care. See you next time.